Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Fallen Angel, Buzz Kennington, Data Magnet, and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again, and now on to the story. Story number 1. Technical Bob, written by Lords of Jupe. In every one of our ships, we have at least one unique relic. Humans. Those hardy, terrifying, obtuse, stupid, ill-advised, glorious wonders. Ship them in every direction and from every manufacturing port. Some in batches of two or three, others by the thousands. And every ship captain who can carry one, those choose to do so and find that humans and their allies are much more prone to treating them well for it. Then it comes down to one moment with one human in one fight, and it wasn't even a culture that got involved. Three centuries after humans had reached into their skies and plucked their future out of the clouds, they were spreading across the galaxy on the back of anything that moved or admitted paying passages. Hitchhikers, drifters, soldiers of fortune, and even the odd wandering mystic, having a human aboard meant a small degree of social status. After all, was it not the humans who stopped the plagues of Hynet, damning the flow by sacrificing a ship's worth of its own people, and stave off the surge of the Kalo flower explosion by detonating a power plant on the capital mood itself? Ingenuity, perseverance, and their bizarre means of living, the three things which guided most choices in hiring or admitting one aboard a given ship. It meant having a technician who could stay awake for entire cycles as opposed to needing relief after one and a half, maybe two shifts worth of time. A medic who could and would donate their own blood to support the comparable species, just out of habit and need. To have a soldier who died defending their chosen charges and exterminate anything that may rear its head as a threat. And if one was lucky, and if the human was so inclined, one could get all three for the same price. Passage to the next port of call, or ship, or just a place on a distant moon to call their own. We long ago gave up guessing why they did that. To travel so lightly, bond so tightly, and fight so blindly. And still, they smile, and they sing, and they dance. And they travel the stars on a whim and die there alone. Those things that they ship out from those manufacturing ports and distribution hubs. They're a type of soft drink dispenser. Approximately two meters tall, one meter wide and deep, and require currency of some level. As they are a symptom of commerce, the brands available are rarely name brand, often almost after market varieties, and they taste, as a rule, like liquid regret. Yet they do the advertised job of providing fluid recharging, and often near distressing periodically criminal amount of quasi-legal stimulants to boot. Humans seem to enjoy the stuff, so they're kept around for such reasons. And then there's the matter of the little brass placard that is stamped on the side of each of them. One of the earliest designers of zero-gravity friendly variant of the container for the off-brand beverages. He had a child, one of many wonders of the spaceways, and it was he whose name is on the placards. It is his father's legacy, reminding his customers of the importance of being a good human. And it is a warning to the rest of the cosmos that those machines, they are sentinels, hosted in thousands of spaceports, aboard countless vessels, and abandoned in the strangest of places. A human was here, stranger, and to remember his name. It is a way to honor his son's sacrifice as well. His son, he was known only as Technical Bob, a wanderer of worlds, 
Any trouble with the machine he himself made in his father's pantry, and he slept next to it, wherever he was stationed. It contained a small generator run by loosely regulated fuel slugs, meaning it was inexpensive to operate, near for touch risky. Should someone break it open and steal the barely consumable beverages within it, the generator provided light, heat, and a small amount of current for the running of small devices. The sorts of things that a traveler enjoys and often needs. Nothing major beyond a few tools being recharged on demand, really. Then, uh, one day, the ship he was traveling on, the Kalasha I Viceroy, was visited by the Ural I Pirate Faction, and they rarely kept prisoners for too long. A subspace is an awful way to negotiate hostage pricing, and the crews tended to get bored fast. What was so many juicy? unsuspecting prisoners to play with, until there were none left to enjoy. Thus, most ships, at seeing a Uralayan ship, would choose to vent coolants, discard heat sinks, and supercritical the reactors. Better to fry alive than be taken alive, most reasoned. The periodic release of footage captured from the sea's pirate archives was instructive enough for that lesson. That fateful day, Technical Bob was working on the comm suite monitoring subspace traffic reports, and overheard the moment the pirate's major vessel would be parking close enough to send out their combat drone engineers, which would be more than effective work horses to literally dismantle the ship that he was riding in. Which, well, he wasn't just going to let that happen. After signing off and discussing the matter with the captain, he asked for three things before the captain would suicide the ship itself. One, that the ship be brought to a sharp, hard turn to port on his command. Two, that the cargo bay that he lived in be vented into space. Three, that someone tell his father that he didn't blame, did love him, and wanted to be remembered for something beautiful. The captain, who'd known Technical Bob for six months of hard, often unrewarding and loyal service, saluted the now-dismissed technician and still... He also readied the vent coolant and radiator fins. Whatever Technical Bob had in mind, he never said it would be the end of the problem. Thus, Technical Bob went to his small, barely their home aboard the alien vessel, and did the unthinkable. The story is told a hundred ways, you see. Some say he strapped himself to a machine he brought with him. Others say that he opened it up first, and then he strapped himself to it. And still others say that he was specific about which brand of beverage he drank before doing all of this and plunking it almost 500 credits worth of coins, dislodging almost a full 100 cans of soda. In any case, the captain held to his word, and as the pirate ship approached him from behind, seemingly unsuspecting, he suddenly vented both off-gas and every available vernier thruster to port, which had two major effects. The first being, any crew members not strapped in regretted that. And the other being, it shot Technical Bob and his personal payload out of the ship at approximately 0 0.009 of light. For a moment, Technical Bob was the fastest living thing in space. And then, Technical Bob opened up the soda machine's front panel. Nearly a hundred Pressurized, high-speed cylinders packed with fluid shot into the front plating of a vessel used to broadside fighting, and it was followed with a 300-kilogram kinetic kill weapon. For that same moment, an unarmored, unarmed transport ship ready to blow itself into a hydrogen memory was the most dangerous thing in space. Technical Bob rocketed through that ship, calls correcting himself through means left best undiscussed. No two physicists can or will agree on how it worked, yet it did. His maneuver killed himself, of this there is no doubt, and it also carved a hole through the 350-meter ship, the height and width of a standardized cargo bay door. Technical Bob died, of course, and he is alive in every man woman, and other who sees the name of these machines, just as his entire crew of his swarm ship, many of whom will tell the story with pride. As well we should. Now, gentlemen and ladies of the Elia Pirate Fleet, 
You are aiming guns at a vehicle you are pursuing at 0.303 light. The partially Terran starship is hauling 37,599 of those machines, and we have opened all 62 of our portside cargo bay doors. Your move. End of story. Story number two. I don't understand. Aren't humans supposed to be capable of doing every task? Written by OK Struggle 7016. Well, to answer that question, no, not all humans are capable of doing every task. When I first recruited a human into my crew of eight, I never thought I would escalate things so quickly. According to the website I saw, humans were advertised as hard-working individuals that required only a few things. Food, water, Terran recreational equipment, and beds. The first time I heard humans were essential to a vessel is because of a fellow captain in a group boasted on how efficient these humans were in their work. And she even claimed that the human paid at least 300 credits per month for just working with him. This is not what I had in mind. The human that I had recruited on the website showed nothing that the website had stated. The human, named Angelo in question, argued that he would only do these chores than to fix stellar engines or to rewire faulty electrical circuits across the innards of the ship, nor to even help out in simple tasks such as firing weapons. What's even worse, he paid almost half of the creds that I merely expected him to pay every month. This is not what I had in mind. What's surprising, though, is that the ship was cleaner than it used to be, and the food was served to the crew was more sustainable, to say the least. Some of the boxes in cargo hold were neatly packed in alphabetical order. I assume this Angelo is up to it, even if it has no help in the major possibility. All it does is doing either the chores or his insinuating silence, looking at his data communicator for his spare time. However, there are a few things that are unique to him. He is more of a morale booster, as he gets along with the other crew without any problems. Food is definitely the cause of increased productivity in the ship. He solves things head-on, even if it means he gets hurt for it. I remember the time when the human suddenly jumped into a brawl between two of my men, and he de-escalated the situation through talk and reason, even if he got bruised arm and a bleeding nose. He learns quickly, solving impossible tasks that the human can handle. He even fixed up the stellar engines and fixed up the wiring inside the ship last month. The human said that he learned through DIY videos. He knows how to do business especially to other humans that we deal with every single time. For some reason, he can get things for half the price in the human markets and sell them for double in a different market. Note to self, bring Angela to negotiations. All I'm saying is, not all humans come in full packages. They are not miracle workers, as the website has stated, and do not expect humans to pay you the supposed creds that you wanted because not all of them have deep pockets. Written in response to what if aliens mistook a list of humans in a rent room website as a recruitment website. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.